Well, good morning. My name is Jim Entz. I'm the coordinator of CHAP, the uh, Porterville College Cultural Historical Awareness Program. Just a moment to give you a little bit on this. Uh, it was organized in 2002 to enhance students' awareness of important aspects of our society to which they may previously have had little or no exposure. A theme is chosen by CHAP members each school year. This year the theme is the Anthropocene. Um, and faculty members across campus are encouraged to integrate elements of that theme into their coursework and are encouraged to encourage their students to attend these events. Events such as this with a guest speaker or speakers are offered throughout the year and they're free and open to the public. So please avail yourselves of, of these programs. I think they're great. So. All right, uh, let's take a moment and if you would um, silence your cell phones, that would be appreciated. Also, these proof of attendance tickets, if you're a student who wants one of these, or just anyone who wants one of these, uh, there'll be somebody by the door, it could very likely be me, who will be handing these out. Uh, so uh, those will be available after the lecture. All right, now, um, now the introduction. Um, Dr. Alex Saragossa will be speaking on the topic, the history of Latinos in the Central Valley. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has taught for the Department of Ethnic Studies and for the American Studies Program. He was born in Madera, California. Um, he's the son of Mexican immigrant farm laborers, and he worked in the fields along with his parents. He is a graduate of Fresno State, Harvard, and the University of California, San Diego. And he has published widely on Mexico, immigration, and Latino history. In 2012, he was visiting professor at the Sorbonne in Paris, France, and he was lecturer at several universities, such as the University of Aix-en-Provence, University of Texas in Austin, Universidad Nacional Autonoma, uh, excuse my for pronunciation, uh, the Mexi Mexico, Universidad de Salamanca, Spain, among several other institutions of higher education. Professor Saragossa was the recipient of the 2017 Excellence in Teaching Award from the Osher Life Learning Institute at UC Berkeley. And he has been selected to the Distinguished Lecture Program of the Organization of American Historians. He is currently writing a book on the history of the Mexican origin population of the Central Valley of California. Well, here he is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we're on. Can you hear me in the back? Wait. No, not yet. Okay, let's see. Thank you for clapping, even though I haven't said a word yet. Uh, hopefully you'll clap at the end. Um, I, the handout gives you some basic historical background to Cinco de Mayo. And when you think about it, uh, the Cinco de Mayo is still celebrated here in the United States, even though the, the date itself goes back to the 1860s. And since that time, even here in the San Joaquin Valley, the earliest mention that I have found is in the Fresno Bee in 1879. People were already celebrating El Cinco de Mayo here in the Central Valley. But uh, before I get started, um, I do want to mention a couple of things because inevitably people ask, if you're of Mexican descent, why is your name Alex? Well, uh, a long time ago, if you didn't have money uh, to have your child in a hospital, they had casas de maternidad as they were called. In English, they were called sanitariums. And they were usually for women who were low income and were about to have a child. They, you were expected to have a child within 72 hours. My mom's English at the time was very limited. So after I was born, um, a nurse came in in order to register me uh, into you know, the birth certificate and that sort of stuff. Um, and my mom's English was not very good. The, the nurse came in two or three times, very frustrated that my mother had not chosen a name for me yet. 
in part because she didn't understand what is going to be the name of your child, yeah. sort of thing. And uh, finally, she brought literally a board with names on it that started with A. And luckily, my mother pointed at Alex rather than Abercrombie or Abigail or God knows what sort of thing. So that's why it's Alex. My friends in Mexico, when I, when I first went to Mexico for the first time, they all wanted to know, ¿Por qué te pones Alex? Tu nombre es Alejandro. And then I had to tell the story all over again. And undoubtedly, some of you in the audience are saying, ¿Who qué cagabachado? Alex. Okay. I wish it was Alejandro, okay? My daughter's name is, guess what? Alejandra. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you very much for your presence. I know it's finals for a lot of you uh, in the audience, and you sacrificed your study time to be here. But uh, as I understand it, with these little cards, you're guaranteed to at least get an A minus in the class. All right? And if you take the quiz at the end of my lecture and you do well enough, you get an A plus. All right? I'm kidding. There's no, there's no quiz. Now, I move around when I talk. And um, so uh, if you, uh, the cameraman and this sort of thing, thank you very much for putting up with my moving around. It's a way of getting rid of nervous energy. Now, usually for me to talk about the Cinco de Mayo, it takes me two weeks in my course, six hours of lecture. So I'm gonna do this in 45 minutes max. Try to keep it to 35 so you can ask questions if you like uh, and this sort of thing. Now this first slide, which I haven't tested yet. Uh, I'm assuming this, yeah, there we go. Okay. Now, usually in my class, and depending on the semester and so on, my record I think is 987 students. Uh, I ask people to look at each other. Now, I know it's kind of awkward to turn around and look at someone, but this is an opportunity for those of you who have wanted to, to stare at that person you've been wanting to look at for the last 20 minutes, okay, sort of thing. Uh, and usually my students being of a certain age and this sort of thing, giggle and so forth and so on. But what I emphasize, and particularly when my audience has large numbers of people of Latin American descent, because at Berkeley we get Salvadoreños, we get Guatemaltecos, Andureños, Chilenos, we even get Argentines who don't speak Spanish, they speak Argentino. Okay, sort of thing. Um, in that respect, I want to emphasize for today the Mexican aspect of this story. And that's why the handout, because it saves me at least five hours of lecturing to you about it. But there's a backstory. If you want, feel free to ask questions to clarify this and that and the other. But the reason I ask my students to look around and we're talking about Latinos in general, or in this case, primarily people of Mexican origin, we are all different. The diversity is amazing. A lot of my students who are third, fourth generation, they can barely get through the menu of Taco Bell. And they use a lot of Spanglish. They mix Spanish and English, or they use the wrong word. Uh, growing up, I'll never forget, I had a Spanish teacher Mr. Gomez at Madera High School and you know I grew up with parents who never went to primaria or secundaria. They barely made it through education in the United States. My mother went to the seventh grade. My, da my dad didn't even get that far. So they were not well educated either in Spanish or English. I did not grow up with formal Spanish. So here I am in a high school classroom. I don't think my good friend Arturo Zamora here, who I know since high school days and this sort of thing, um, he asked, and he was very proud that he was a graduate de la Academia Española del Idioma, blah, blah, blah. And he always called me Zaragoza. <laughs> Probably other things too. <laughs> But we went through the body and various ways of talking about, in my case, feet. And in my household, feet were patas, not pies. 
So when I mention patas, I'll never forget, ah, Señor Zaragoza, usted tiene patas. <laughs> and I said, yes. And then he corrected me with the pies, all right? Now I emphasize that because of the diversity of generations. If you are here first generation, more than likely you grew up speaking Spanish and had to learn English either from my grandfather, who didn't know hardly anything, but he knew bad words. <laughs> I, I learned son of a biche from him before I was four years old, okay? And that was about it. But the important point here is then come second generation, third generation, and this is very important to my story and I wish I could tell more of it, and that is that we are very distinctive. Like when I say we, those of Mexican descent, because unlike the Italians, the Armenians, etc., and we could go through the Chinese, J Japanese, etc., they came usually in one huge wave and then a precipitous decline. So 80% of all the Italians in the United States who can trace back to that big surge of migration of the 1920s or so, or early 1900s, I should say, 80% of them came within a 20-year period. And then it became a trickle because of the racist legislation that was passed beginning in 1917 and then another legislation in 1921 and still another in 1924. And the Italian migration after that, as I said, was a trickle for all kinds of reasons. If you want, we can talk about those at the end of my talk today. What does this mean? The diversity of the Mexican origin population then is one of the key points I want to emphasize today. We all look different. Some of us have a lot of hair. Some of us are losing our hair. Some of you are thin. And let's be honest, some of you are thinner. Uh, and some of you are good looking. And some of you are better looking. Okay, all right. And that diversity is at various levels. Whether we're talking about income now, there is a very strong Mexican middle class in much of California including here in Porterville, and I, in writing the book, I have to look at counties, Fresno, Merced, Madera, Kings, and Tulare, and there's a strong middle class, but yet these five counties share one of the highest, depending on which county and which year, highest level of poverty among Latinos in the state of California. And we even have a few people way at the top, relatively speaking, okay? So I want to emphasize this, this diversity here because some of my generalizations, I wish I had the time, but I only have 35 minutes and now down to 30 perhaps, to talk about all of the permutations of, among people of Mexican origin in the United States, including the fact that I didn't know about the Cinco de Mayo until I got involved in the Chicano movement. And it was then that I learned about that. And one of the reasons why among one of my areas of concentration as, as a student was on the history of Mexico, because my parents couldn't tell me. They never went to a school in Mexico to know the names of the great heroes and, and combatants and so on in the Guerra de la Reforma, where in 1861, the conservatives lost to the liberals, as they were called, then came the Constitution of 1857, and then came the war that made Benito Juarez almost a saint, at least in Mexican textbooks and so on. I had to learn all of that when I was in college. My parents didn't know their own history, as opposed to those who've had the opportunity to go to school in Mexico, and they know something at least about the Cinco de Mayo. So with that as a long preface, to my talk today, I'll go forward. Take, for example, the terms of identity. I had a heck of a time. Do I, do I entitle my book Latinx? Do I use Latino? Do I use Latino slash Latina? Do I say Chicana? Do I say Mexicano or Mexican, Mexican American, Spanish American, Latino American? What term to use? And a lot depends when you came. Understandably, if you're a recién llegado, recently arrived, you're going to say, I'm Mexican. I thought I was a Mexican. Until I went to Mexico the first time, I opened my mouth, ah, tú eres del otro lado. 
the otro lado. And then, very quickly, I found out. But there's differences in Mexico itself. And allow me a personal example. When I went the first time to consult El Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City to work, start working on my dissertation and so on, I lived with a, with a Mexican family, solidly middle class. The son worked at a bank. His wife uh, was a uh, clerical worker there. That's how they met. They fell in love. They got married. And uh, a widow, La Señora de la Casa, who was very middle class. Where she came from, I don't know exactly, but clearly she was very proud of being not poor. So after a couple of weeks, I was charming and so on, at least I tried to be. Um, she asked, and she always called me Alejandro. Alejandro, ¿qué quieres de cenar? Te voy a hacer algo especial. especial. ¿Qué quieres? Well, I'll make you something very special. And I said, hijo, tengo ganas de nopalitos en chile y tortilla. And she gave me a look. Nopales es comida para indios. Whoa. That was my first slap in the face of class difference and race difference in Mexico. And if you go to Mexico today, you still hear a vez en cuando. Uh, eh, está bonita, pero está muy morena. I've been to baptisms where people said, you know, they always get the baby. Ay, qué lindo, qué chulo. Yo, there's always some comadre or some compadre who walks away. Ay, pero está muy prieto. So there is that to contend with in that respect. All right? And of course, the opposite. Las güeras y las rubias and so forth. My mother was a color of that young man's shirt there. She was rubia. My dad was at the opposite end of the spectrum. And as a kid, you hear people talking about, oh, I viene sombra y luz. My dad was sombra, shadow, and luz was my mother, sort of thing. And, you know, it takes a while before you learn about these sorts of things. Okay. And then, of course, there's language and big differences in language. When I was a kid, no one said, orale, way. Way wasn't a common term to say guy or dude, or sometimes, depending on the situation, it meant something else, sort of thing. And other terms of that notion. I got to learn how to say, buenas tardes, damas y caballeros, respetable público. All these things I didn't grow up with. I had to learn from somewhere else. Whereas other Mexicanos who get here know those terms very well. So I won't be labor. Whoops, sorry. What did I do? There we go. Okay. No? All right. There we go. I think I'm doing this correctly. No? There we go. Okay. So let's talk about the Cinco de Mayo because it's here right now. I was watching a show, I think it was a basketball game, where Corona Beer is saying Cinco de Mayo. Or as I heard uh, my, my daughter say one day when she was a student at UC Santa Barbara, yeah, everybody calls it Drinko de Mayo. Okay, <laughs> It's a good time to go drinking. And this is part of the... On the other hand, this is part of the diversity. If you go to Chihuahua and you ask for mole, it's going to look a certain color. The first time I went to Oaxaca and I asked for mole, I got this black thing on my plate. And I remember telling the mesera, the, the waitress, Senorita, yo, yo pedí mole. Señor, es mole. No, el mole debe de ser un, un color muy distinto. Bueno, señor, este, ese es el mole. I said, este mole es como, como lo hizo mi mamá. And she looked around. And in, to put in English, I don't see your mother here. <laughs> so I learned very quickly about region, regional differences between Chihuahua and Oaxaca, between Campeche, Tabasco on the one side, and, say, Sinaloa and Sonora on the other. 
in all ki different kinds of ways. And those of you who've seen that series with Eva Longoria, although I have my, my quibbles with how the whole history is presented and so on, it's all about that. It's on CNN, I think it's every week on Sundays or something. And it tells you about these differences. And once in a while, she'll throw in something about the history that makes Oaxaca different from Yucatan or Quintana Roo and so forth and so on. Okay, now this one I really like. I see it everywhere. An authentic Mexican cuisine. After what I just told you, what's authentic? I'm authentically Mexican, or so I thought. So what does that mean when you're authentic? Does that mean you speak Spanish well? Quote unquote Mexican Spanish? Because if you're from Oaxaca or Tabasco or Campeche or Chiapas and you go to Monterrey, Nuevo León, they know that you are not from Nuevo León. So in that respect, it seems to me, one of the real issues here underlying the whole holiday and so on is the issue of authenticity. Who was going to be Mexicano? Hasta las cachas at the battle of Puebla in 1862. How was Mexicanidad defined between these two sides, all of them Mexican, born overwhelmingly in Mexico itself, fighting each other in this brutal, vicious war that lasted three years? Who was the authentic Mexican? And for a time, the conservatives had one, and they considered themselves muy mexicanos, but this is the way we want to govern. And then came the liberals who defeated them in 1861. And then those same conservatives, after a long history of colonialism, went to France to cultivate and to court the French to have what the conservatives had wanted since the beginning of Mexican history after the wars of independence. And that is to have a monarchy, just like the Spaniards, except it would be run by people born in Mexico. So in many respects, the Guerra de la Reforma, as it was called, was really still a war over how, or over the residue that was left over from 300 years of Spanish colonialism. I'll just give a 10 second example of the diversity. Because right here, on the way over here, we saw a restaurant, I saw a restaurant. And it had, guess what? Authentic Mexican food. I wanted to make a U-turn and take the menu so I could make copies and pass it out to you. All right. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of speaking to another group. The Comisión Honorífica Mexicana Americana. And there's a backstory to this mural. I don't know how many of you read about it in the newspaper about the city council delaying the decision, then finally they caved in, probably because they said this is not a good idea. We're not going to stand on this hill and fight this battle. Because the city council and all of the people who are involved in the politics of Porterville and so on remembered what happened in 2018. And I'll get to that a little bit later in the talk. So what's the backstory? 1927, and before that throughout the Southwest in particular, but also in places like Chicago, etc., where a lot of Mexican immigrants had arrived, what were called mutualista organizations. Usually people coming together, donating money to make sure that people would be buried appropriately and so forth, or if someone was really sick, lost their job, and therefore went through hard times or to help out a widow, etc., uh, that, that had lost her husband, who still had children, very young children at home, things like that. And in this respect, the, this organization here in Porterville goes back to 1927. And this was throughout the various parts of the Southwest, as I mentioned earlier. You can see people here very proud of sitting for this posed photo and I want to emphasize that because as a historian, you go through the archives, it's real hard to find pictures of Mexicanos picking oranges or lemons or taking down the olives from trees, etc. 
Almost always, even in my own family. I have a picture of my grandfather, who never went to school, who the first time I saw him sign his name, he got a pen. And like school children in Mexico in those days, they would wet the tip of a pencil. And he very carefully made an X. It's the first time I really understood that my grandfather was completely illiterate, could not read or write. But the point being that in Poe's pictures, I have a picture of my grandfather in a suit, really nice suit. I found out later that there was a studio in West Fresno that would take your picture and they had all these clothes on a closet and they would fit people who really never had the money to buy a real suit, but you could take a picture, very formal and so on. Probably to impress somebody because you wanted to marry. I don't know. Okay. And uh, Cinco de Mayo celebrations were taking place throughout the Southwest beginning in the late 19th century. This photo happens to come uh, from 1910 here in California because the mutualista organizations were throughout the state of California and throughout Arizona, uh, Texas, Colorado, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, Illinois, especially in and around Chicago. And the celebration went into the 40s and the 50s, uh, and this particular photo is from the 1940s, and you can see again uh, people recognizing the Cinco de Mayo in that period of time. But there was something else going on in Porterville in 1927. And I think it's really important to stop for a moment and think about what it meant to be a Mexican in Porterville in 1927. If you go through the census, even though there's a lot of room for error and so on, there were very few African Americans in Porterville. You could probably count them on two hands. But there were a lot of Mexicanos. And in that respect, this picture tells us something about the context in which this group of people of Mexican origin decided to be proud of who they were, to be able to show the Mexican flag along with the American flag, because waving the Mexican flag didn't mean you didn't want to be in the United States. But imagine in many respects how this was implicitly, if not explicitly, a statement a voice. Somos mexicanos y tenemos orgullo de ser mexicanos. It hurts sometimes to go through experiences like that, implicitly or explicitly, to get the stare. What are you doing here? To get the look. Now, oh, it's a Mexican, can hardly speak English, that sort of thing. My first job out of the fields was working at a butcher at a small grocery store where a lot of Mexicans came and the butcher got tired of finding, uh, can anyone uh, tell me what they want? So I was hired. I was a good student, right across from the Spanish kitchen on uh, Yosemite Avenue in Madera. And I'll never forget the pride that I had when somebody came in uh, and they had a little, uh, a child with them Dile que queremos una libra de carne picada. And I heard her say that. Ah, señora, quiero una libra de carne picada. Ah, habla español? She was surprised. I spoke Spanish. And the rest, quote unquote, is history. There was no embarrassment being part of the Ku Klux Klan in those days. People had picnics for the Ku Klux Klan at Mooney Park in Visalia, right here in Porterville and other places throughout the United States, but it's including here in, at that time, not the liberal California that we might be able to characterize today's politics uh, in that respect. And before Disneyland, Orange County, Anaheim had public parades, just like here in Porterville, just like in Visalia, just like in Madera, in Fresno, believe it or not, there was a meeting of the Ku Klux Klan and they called it Fiesta Ku Klux Klan gathering at John Euless Park. And those of you who follow the Fresno Bee, they changed the name of the ballpark.
because Mr. Hewlett was apparently uh, a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But there was something else going on during this period of time, and I wish I had more time to discuss it, and that was this kind of science about notions of superiority and inferiority. 59% of the women that were sterilized under a law that allowed for the sterilization of women and men of the people st sterilized, 59% were Latinas. I'm assuming most of them overwhelmingly of Mexican origin because they were mentally inferior or what they called in those days, in those days, unfeeble or enfeeble. Now, if you don't speak English in those days, some people thought that was already a sign that you were stupid. Just like we put a literacy requirement in the 1917 Immigration Act because of the assumption that all those quote-unquote Polacks, all those quote-unquote WAPs, etc., that were coming in at that time were so stupid that they couldn't read. And then they realized that wasn't enough, and that's why we had the 1921 Immigration Act. But what's important here is this was 1928 when this organization called, you have it right there, the Human Betterment Foundation. It was called Eugenics. And these were the people who promoted IQ tests to people who were not native English speakers. And if you did bad on the IQ test, this was ipso facto proof that you were dumb. Uh, Natalia Molina, for example, has argued in an essay uh, that she wrote several years ago. She was just an assistant professor at the time, uh, etc. When she went through the archive, uh, etc. And it was clear that a lot of the women who were sterilized were not mentally challenged. And these signs were commonplace. It's really nice to know that we don't have signs like this anymore, sort of thing. But this gives you a sense of the attitudes of that period of time of the 1920s. This was commonplace all over the Southwest, where businesses, for one reason or another, didn't want people like me, to be there. Now for me, this is the most powerful slide. Timothy Egan has just published a great book. It's called Fever in the Heartland. And it's about the residue of the KKK in the Midwest. How even though the KKK went down, came apart as a national organization, especially by the 1940s and so on, because it was no longer politically correct to be out, overt, racist, and so on, if for no other reason because of what happened to the Jews during World War II uh, and so on in Germany. But Egan's book talks about the children of the Ku Klux Klan. And I don't want to take any more time here in terms of going back to that former slide, but if you look closely at the slides of the parades and whether it was Fresno or whether it was Porterville or whether it was Visalia or whether it was Sacramento, whatever, what you always see is spectators. And you can't help but think about how many of them were there to, in a sense, throw rocks at the people in their white garb and so on, whether they were there out of curiosity, like we see in high schools and so on, when someone has a fight, you see all these people congregate, fight, fight, and if it's a girl fight, it's a man, it's really good. Or how many of them went to those parades because they sympathized with the views represented by the people who were marching? And Egan's book makes it clear that the children of the KKK often sustained the views of their parents or sustained and maintained the views of their grandparents and so on. And not surprisingly, for all kinds of reasons that if you wish we can talk about after my lecture is over and so on, we see these folks coming out of the woodwork in a manner of speaking again. Lone Star this is the Texas Restaurant Association approved of these signs. And they were all over Texas 
eateries in that respect. And this continued into the 1930s in Texas. And given the current governor, he probably wouldn't mind something like this, except maybe he would say something about immigrants or whatever. This was in Long Beach, California, at a place called Cherry Beach. And some of the people there didn't like the fact that a lot of Mexicans began to congregate in this particular beach. And if they thought their car looked like one that belonged to a Mexican, they put that on the windshields. Parentheses. I love it when people say, you don't look like you're a Mexican. And I always want to say, well, what do you want me to look like? When I was invited to a graduate party at Harvard, I'll never forget John Cheever, not a very nice guy, not related, by the way, to the writer. And he opened the door, and uh, my wife had made uh, enchiladas. And we were invited to a lot of parties, but they always said, can you bring some enchiladas? But the very first time, I'll never forget, he opened the door. Alex, you're here, and he turned to the people already and said, hey, this is Alex, he's a real Mexican. Well, I didn't know whether to throw down my sombrero and do the jarabe tapatio or what, you know, sort of thing. But the important point here is, you know, that these people selected the cars that looked like they belonged to the Mexicans. I don't have a picture of what those cars might have looked like. I don't know if they were lowrider cars or whatever. I don't know. But this is 2012. It's not that long ago. So what did it mean? to have a parade like this for the Mexicanos of these organizations, like the one you hear, like the one you have here in Portoville since 1927, what did it mean for them? How did they see the celebration of their heritage, regardless of how you define it, in this kind of context? I would submit to you that for some of them, and perhaps for many of them, and perhaps for the overwhelming majority of them, it was a way of, in a sense, speaking back to the beliefs of these people. You may want to call it a form of resistance. Now the Cinco de Mayo has become very commercialized, whether it's Modelo, or whether it's Corona, or whether it's Safeway, or whatever it is. And here you have the Cinco de Mayo corner at uh, a store. And where I live, we even have Safeway with Cinco de Mayo specials. Guacamole, avocados, chips, tortilla chips, beer, and usually a few other things of that sort, like queso fresco or something. So the commercialization of heritage, it's not that I'm against it and so on, but here is a whole store. Every day is Cinco de Mayo at the store. Okay. And allegedly these are typical goods that are being sold that one could find almost anywhere at, say, the Mercado Principal of Guadalajara. I don't know. I've never been to this store, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to show you this slide. Uh, sort of thing. By the way, this is from New York City. I don't know how many of you know this, but there's over 20,000 Mexicans now in New York City. And of course, we have bailes, we have mariachis, and depending on where the Cinco de Mayo is being celebrated, it could be musica de banda, it could be musica conjunto, uh, etc. All right? And of course, almost always we have folkloric dancers and so on, sort of thing. And that's okay. Because there's many other forms that, of cultural arts and so on that, that could be celebrated as part of the Cinco de Mayo, as part of an expression of artistic um, heritage, uh, etc. people of Mexican descent in the United States. And of course, the socializing. Um, I'm, I'm assuming uh, this afternoon, Fernando, there'll be some food being sold, you know, I don't know, este, uh, pan dulce, whatever it is sort of thing, a, socialist, a socializing event, uh, and this sort of thing. When my daughter was in college, they literally had Cinco de Mayo parties uh, put on, believe it or not, by fraternities and so forth, and believe me, it was Drinco Cinco uh, sort of thing, at least what she tells me. And, of course, we have pachangas. Uh, I don't know how many of you are going to parties. 
where you take an hour away from your studies for the final exams and you decide to go pachanga time. And I'm sure it only lasts 30 minutes because you have to get back to the library to study uh, and so on. Although I see some of you smiling and you're already thinking it's going to be going all night. I worry about uh, studying later. <laughs> and this has become part of Cinco de Mayo. When I was teaching uh, at Fresno State, where I started my academic career, went back to my uh, alma mater, etc., this was definitely the thing to do in, uh, on Cinco de Mayo. Go to the rainbow, have a great time, study later. But what does this sign mean? in 2018. Who would stand up and put this in the face of people who are recently arrived? What are the implications of the woman who's taking a picture, I don't know why, I guess to prove that these quote unquote people, them, are here sort of thing? And some of you who might remember the presidential campaign of 2016, we saw a lot of these signs in, at, these, at these rallies and so forth during that period of time. So what does it mean to have someone, and by the way, he also has Jihad Sucks on his t-shirt. I guess he didn't like Muslims being here very much either sort of thing. So in this respect, what Timothy Egan argues in his new book Maybe he's not so far away from the conclusion about how generations of people can sustain the views of people who marched, who were spectators, and so on, at parades of the Ku Klux Klan. 2019, not very far away in Visalia. And some of the people who went to that KK office probably came one or two, maybe more, from Farmersville, from Strathmore, from Exeter, and maybe even Porterville. It didn't last long. They closed out. But some of that animus, some of that, you have to call it hatred, continues, unfortunately, in the minds of some I think we all would like to hope in the minds of a few. Because he didn't ask if you were born here in the United States, uh, if you were a citizen versus quote unquote an illegal. He just started shooting with the intent of killing as many Mexicans as the ammunition that he had in his automatic weapon. Was this just well, come on, one event out of how, how many years? Yeah, you're going to have some wacko out there doing something like this, but this doesn't ha happen very often. Well, how many often times does it have to take place for us to take it serious? And you know, a lot of racial violence goes unreported. A lot of gender violence goes unreported. A lot of violence against Asians goes unreported. A lot of the violence against Jews goes unreported. So we really don't know. It has to be reported before it even makes the FBI index of hate crimes and so forth and so on. Now some people look at this slide and they go, mm-hmm, what did I tell you? Damn Mexicans are taking over. I can't even get on a bus without hearing Spanish. You know, it's kind of interesting because I'm part of that generation where businesses first started to put signs on the window. Say, habla espanol. Usually with used car dealerships. And then it went from there. And I wasn't even aware of the fact that my employer at one point put a sign on the door. Se habla español. I wanted to, when I first thought about it, I, I should have put in parentheses. Finally? Okay. And 
in this respect, population growth. Now, I don't, I don't say this from experience, but I do have a lot of white friends, and as far as I know, quote unquote, white people love sex as much as anybody else. So why the difference? And there's demographic reasons, the usefulness of recent immigrants and so forth. But some people look at that slide and say, whoa, we really are, quote unquote, in the demographic sense, taking over. And that has led recently to a lot of things, including this notion that recent immigrants, regardless of place of birth and so on, whether they're Mexican or whether they're Muslim, whatever it is, sort of thing. They're replacing, quote unquote, white people. And sowing this kind of fear that somehow the arrival of these new folks, just like in the, in, in the 1890s, 1896, an organization sprung up, majority of them, graduates of Harvard, it was called the Immigration Restriction League, who promoted over and over again legislation against immigration. It started with against the Catholics, the Irish, and so on. And if you want, we can talk about that. But it resulted eventually in the 1917 Immigration Act that I mentioned earlier. Now, he has been replaced. <laughs> but that doesn't mean, ladies and gentlemen, that the people who made him the most popular talk show host on that network, it didn't mean that they were replaced. They're still out there. And we have to ask ourselves, what are the implications of that? What does that mean to Mexicanos who are recently arrived? What does it mean to Mexicanos who've been here three or four generations in that respect? And then some people are really scared about this. So much so that we cannot pass immigration reform because of its association with the electoral consequences of the new immigrants. In 2018, under the California Voting Rights Act of 2002, lawsuits began to multiply, and many of their early cases took place right here in the Central Valley. Two of them in my hometown of Madera, in Hanford, in Visalia, right here in Portable. It took a lawsuit to change the way we elect officials in many communities in California, including here in the Central Valley, to district elections. And it has begun to change the landscape of politics here in the Central Valley, where we have more and more people of Latin American origin, overwhelmingly of Mexican origin, who are now mayors, who are now on the boards of schools and so on, who are on the hospital boards, etc., who are city council members, uh, and in some cases now on the Board of Supervisors and the like. But it took a lawsuit because it was resisted over and over again, whether it was Hanford, whether it was Madera, whether it was Exeter, there was a case in Exeter, uh, etc. sort of thing. And we have to ask why. It makes all the sense in the world if we want a truly open and democratic society. And here we go again. A presidential campaign implicitly. First it was Proposition 187. Some of you were just in diapers perhaps. And then again in Arizona, SB 1070. And now in Florida last week, Senate Bill 1718. What they mean by Senate is the state Senate and so on. And so once again, the issue of immigration the issue of conceivably this replacement theory getting legitimacy and credibility and so forth among those who want to believe that Tucker Carlson was right. 
We can't replace the people on the left. I am a strong believer in the freedom of speech. And if you have these views, you have those views. I think they're wrong, deeply wrong, especially if you consider yourself a patriot of the United States and you believe in the Constitution, it's right there. It's called freedom of speech. So I'm not sure what the future holds for that little girl. I hope she makes it to college, perhaps here at Porterville. I hope she transfers to whether it's Cal State University Bakersfield or Fresno State or Stanford or UCLA or UC Berkeley, where I would love to see little girls like them, like her, pardon me, get to Berkeley, get to UC Santa Barbara or whatever it may be. Don't you think it's time that she doesn't have to deal with the look? What are you doing here? Where did you come from? And it's not a question, it's almost an accusation. Just like we saw in, I don't know how many of you saw the special about the crown, the monarchy in Britain, where one of the ladies in waiting of Queen Elizabeth, she was still alive, it just happened, three years ago, if I recall correctly, where she goes to an African woman, of, pardon me, a, a black woman of African descent at a cocktail party and says, where are you from? And she said, here, from London. No, no, but where are you from? Um, I've been, I was born here in England. No, but where were you from? What she was really asking is, what is an African woman doing in this cocktail party? I hope this little girl never has to explain what she is doing here. Where too often in the past, her mother was asked, where are you from? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, questions? I'm sorry I went too long, but you took five of my minutes, okay, sort of thing. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but seriously, uh, thank you very much. I, I know for a lot of you as uh, students and so on, you're really busy. I know a lot of your friends and so on couldn't be here for good reasons. Maybe they had to go to work. I worked all my way through college, so believe me, I know about studying in the morning then going to work in the afternoon or vice versa or going to class at night whatever it might be but thank you very much especially to you students who are going through final exams for those of you who are not students thank you especially for being here uh, i hope that the handout gives you some idea of the history uh, the background to the battle of uh, 5th of 1862 it's a complicated story i wish i could take the time, who in the hell is Napoleon III, or stuff like that. But for the moment, we'll keep it here. So, first question. Yes, um, can you talk a little bit about the role of the Mexican-Americans in the military? Sure, okay. Uh, the question was, can I talk about the role of Mexican-Americans in the military? Um, there's a really good, how shall I say, a really good story when we talk about the military service of people of Mexican origin, where there was no hesitation on the part of my father. My grandfather wanted to send back to Mexico so that he would not be subject to the military draft during World War II. But he said, no, I'm gonna go. And all my uncles said the same thing, okay. And my friend here, Arturo Zamora, and his brothers, when they asked for people, well, I don't know, is it on up there? Yeah, it's okay, um, to go to Vietnam, all of them went. So the military service now in the United States is nearly 20% Latinos. Of those 20%, 80% are 
are people, or yeah, people, men and women, of Mexican origin. So in this respect, the notion that somehow being an immigrant makes, makes you unpatriotic. Unpatriotic. And that was the attitude in the 1920s when we had Americanization programs. Because being an immigrant made you implicitly, if not explicitly, unpatriotic. And I can tell you stories in that respect. But um, to this day, whether they were in Afghanistan or whether they were in Iraq or whether they were in Vietnam, like my friend uh, Arturo Zamora over here to my right, your left, uh, and perhaps some of you have brothers, sisters, uncles, whatever, who've been in the military, and they don't do it just because. Next question. Oh, come on, I wasn't that boring, was I? <laughs> come on, a question. Okay, why don't you ask me about my first date? Now that's a good story. Okay, Arthur, you, you've, you've saved me from total humiliation. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay, uh, my dad and yeah, three of his uncles started in World War II. But uh, then I heard that all the uh, Mexican veterans from World War II went, that went to Texas mm -hmm. couldn't join the VFW. They couldn't join the VFW because the VFW in Texas was yes. so racist yeah. in this respect. And I suspect some of you, especially the students who've taken courses here at Porterville from certain instructors, you know the story about the forming of the GI Forum, where someone who was killed in action was not allowed to be buried in a cemetery because it was only for whites. That's how bad it was in certain parts of the United States. And it happened to uh, people of German origin. A lot of people don't know about the violence against Germans during World War I and World War II, where they were hanged in public, tarred and, uh, and, and, and beat up and so forth, uh, etc. So, you know, but that's hopefully increasingly in the past. Let us hope. Next question or comment, yes. Um. For a long time, the, the recognition of the uh, uh, Afro-Mexicanos in, in Mexico mm -hmm. has not been recognized until just recently. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you credit that to? Híjole. Okay, that's another three-hour lecture about the casta system and how it worked. Okay? The casta system goes back to colonial times. And... You know, our history here in this country, when we talk about British colonialism and taking over what, um, or trying to take over what became known as the 13 colonies and the United States, it didn't last very long. Maybe 100 years. But 300 years of colonialism in Mexico. 300 years. And the Spaniards came as part of their baggage, a long struggle against the Muslims of Spain. It took hundreds of years to finally expel the Muslims. And all during that time, what was accumulating here was an attitude about people who were different that came here to the New World. We call it racism now and so on, but the idea of race had not developed in the same way that we know it today. In this respect, then the caste system was a way of assigning status, primarily social, but also with implications economically. Only certain jobs could go to certain people because in Mexico there were at least 14 categories. Españoles on top, criollos, children of Spanish-born parents who were now living in Mexico, and then I went all the way down. I love the last one. It was called Allí Estás, you're at the bottom. And there were sambos, mulatos, coyotes, lobos. All of these were terms to denote the social racial background who were born in what at that time was called New Spain. But what was interesting about that 
is the corruption within the church. Because there were a lot of priests who would die to be in Mexico City or Guadalajara or Zacatecas, which at that time was a very rich city because of silver mining and so forth and so on. Why? Because when you pass the canasta, right? When you pass the pan to put your, um, put your money in, the priest lived very good, thank you. But if you were out in the boonies of New Spain, what we now call Mexico and so on, that was not a cherry job, so to speak. It's like my students at Berkeley. I always ask them in one way or another, where would you like to work as a blah, 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 whatever it was. Oh, I want to be in LA. I want to be in San Francisco. I want to be in New York and so on. And I always say, why don't you go to Madera, California? <laughs> well, first of all, I said, where's Madera? They don't want to go to Madera if you're a doctor or whatever. I mean, God darn, they close a the hospital in Madera. And if you want to be a doctor in Madera, now there's no hospital to go to, sort of thing. So in this sense, the corruption was, if you were a priest in a poor parish, one way of making a little money, because you, you, know, you charge for marriages, you charge people to be buried in the Catholic cemetery to give the final mendicion, and there's a good story there about Mel Melcor Ocampo and so on, but I'll save it for this afternoon. I don't have the time here. But the point being that people began to pay the priest to lift their social racial status because they could get away with it. Because they were lighter complected. And some of you here are muy hueras as opposed to others of you who are less hueras. Okay? Which meant if I was a young man, I wanted to marry, if I could, una huera. So then I would no longer be a coyote or a lobo or not even a mestizo. Now if I learn a little Spanish and so on, voy a ser el señor Zaragoza de panza y huevo. Okay? <laughs> sort of thing. And so I would have my friends from Porterville, which was a neighborhood in Mexico City at one time. No, I'm kidding. Right? <laughs> oh! Alejandro! ¿Qué estás haciendo? Pues aquí estoy, el señor. Usted no lo conozco, caballero. No, man, you remember me from the, from the barrio Guerrero, La Ciudad de México, ¿no te acuerdas? Don't you remember? And then my wife, who's muy buena. Alejandro, ¿qué, en, ¿qué es esta persona? Right? No sé, mi amor. Está loco. And Arturo, right? Arturo, don't you remember me, man? From Madera, the little town outside. Anyway. So that was the way. And men and women look for good relationships. In part, not, it wasn't just a matter of money. It's also was a matter of what you look like, literally. And I can tell you, my wife loves this story. When we lived in Mexico City for three years, she went to the bank the first time to pay the water bill, because you could do that in Mexico City at that time. And she stood in line like everybody else. And then somebody, con corbata y saco, right, I was going to wear a tie, by the way, but. He went right to the front of the line. And the bank teller, rather than saying, Licenciado, usted tiene que ir al, al final de la cola. He went right to the front. And the people in line accepted him skipping to the front. So the power of just simply having a corbata, un saco, un traje formal, was enough. And he was probably well. Okay. So it still happens, just like I started this lecture today about comida de indios. With la coche, comida de indios. And now, the finest restaurants in Mexico, including the Mexican restaurant I went to at the Intercontinental Hotel in Mexico City, guess what was one of the delicacies? With la coche con nopales. Things have changed. Question. Uh, do you think that classism Louder, please, so. Uh, do you think that classism is linked to regions in Mexico? 
Classism? Yes. Yes. Because, again, a long lecture. The regions of Mexico have different histories. And t today at my afternoon talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But the important point is yes. Because where did the Criollos wanted to live? Where did the Españoles wanted to live? They wanted to live in the center, north central part of Mexico, más o menos from Zacatecas down maybe to Puebla or there, or between Veracruz and Acapulco. That was the core of the colonial Mexican economy of Mexico. Nobody wanted to go to Chiapas. Hay puros indios. Nobody wanted to go to Tabasco, etc., etc. So class relations in certain parts of Mexico were much more rigid than would be the case later. But it's still there, ladies and gentlemen. You go to Mexico City, to Lomas de Chapultepec, a neighborhood. You go to Polanco in Mexico City, it's another world. As opposed to going to, I don't know, um, another part of Mexico City, like La Colonia Guerrero, or worse, the colonias, as they're called, like Nechahualcoyo, which at one time was part of the garbage heap of Mexico City, and so on. So yes, class relations differ by region, and other elements are involved there. If you have to do your servicio nacional in Mexico, I know of people who are from very upper classes, paid, not to be assigned to some remote village in the Mixteca down in Oaxaca. They got to be at the Hospital Militar of Mexico City, the best, arguably the best hospital, it's for the military in Mexico City. First class, many of the doctors trained in, in Texas or California and then they go back because they're paid so well. Incredible benefits and so on, as opposed to working because you're supposed to do that after, after you finish your degrees over there, to do national service, if you will. Anyway, I went over my time. I'm getting the look. I have to go study. <laughs> or I have to get ready for the party. Whatever it may be. Okay? Sort of thing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much for your presence. Thank you.